Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. You know, it was just huge revelations for them at every turn. I saw the message come through that said, can we talk? Oh, gosh, can we? Should I? (laughs) My mind is going a million miles a minute knowing what this means. I'm Sarah Fenske. In 1982, St. Louis, a woman named Joanne Tate was brutally murdered, stabbed in the chest, and sexually assaulted. Her two young daughters were also stabbed and left for dead. They survived, and one daughter, just seven years old, would identify her mother's killer. A man named Rodney Lincoln, who had dated Joanne Tate briefly before her murder, was convicted mostly due to that seven-year-old's testimony. But that's where a different daughter comes into the story. Rodney Lincoln's daughter never believed that her father could have done it. Kay Lincoln's efforts ultimately led to her father's sentence being commuted by then-Governor Eric Greitens. And now Kay Lincoln is front and center in a new podcast that digs into her father's case and explores who really killed Joanne Tate. A single mother brutally murdered in her own home. It was a horrible crime, made all the more horrible by the fact that there were these two little girls who had watched it happen and then been tortured themselves. One of those young girls survives and IDs the suspect. He killed my mom, tried to kill me and my sister. The accused killer sent to prison. End of story, right? Not even close. I don't know how he got there. He was never there. Changing stories. Does memory get better with time? Oh, your memory's better now? No. A man who claims he's innocent. They got me confused with someone else. I did not do that. And a mission to find out the truth. Now, that podcast is called The Real Killer. Uh, You can get it now from iHeartMedia. And we should note this podcast deals with some very ugly facts. Sensitive listeners should use discretion today. And joining us now to talk about it is Leah Rothman. She is the producer of The Real Killer. That's the podcast that premiered last month on iHeartMedia. Leah Rothman, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And we're also joined today by Kay Lincoln, who fought so hard for her father Rodney's freedom. Kay Lincoln, welcome. Thank you so much for having me today, Sarah. So, Kay, for years, Joanne Tate's daughter, Melissa, who was also attacked uh, that day, was insistent that your father committed this crime. What made you not believe her and continue to have faith in your father, Rodney Lincoln? Well, initially, it was simply the fact that he told me he didn't do it. Hmm. I was only 13 years old when this happened, so the only thing I knew to believe in was what my dad was telling me. And had you guys been close before this nightmare began? Yes, we were always very close. And we continued to stay close even after he was sent away. So you had to do that, I assume, through letters at that point or phone calls? Yes, it was letters until I turned 18, letters and phone calls. And then once I turned 18, I was able to go visit and we were able to have you know, face-to-face visits at that time. So this started with almost just an innocent child's belief in her own father's goodness. But you really dug in on this. I mean, the work that you did ultimately led to your dad getting out of prison. What kept you going through multiple years when it would have been so much easier just to give up? Well, the, the knowledge in the belief, initially the belief that he was innocent was enough to prompt me to start looking into it when I was much, much older, an adult um, in my early 30s. And as I uncovered evidence and documents and facts and found more and more pieces to the puzzle, I knew for my own knowledge, from my own research and digging, I knew that he did not do this, that he had always been innocent. And once I had that knowledge and that those pieces of information that proved that 
it could be proven that he was innocent. There was just no option to give up. So Leah, Kay had this long belief, but she was able to get other people with more resources on board for this too. And these are people, you know, investigative journalists, people working for the Midwest Innocence Project. They get a lot of people trying to look into loved ones' cases. What do you think made Kay's efforts successful when it came to her father's case? I think Kay was so prepared. I think she did so much legwork. She was tenacious in, you know, tracking people down, calling them, getting documents, you know, demanding documents. Um, I think that when she went to Steve Weinberg and Sean O'Brien and and all of these people who could potentially help her, I think they were really impressed with her level of knowledge of the case and 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 just how prepared she was. She was she was emotional, but she was measured and she was um, she was prepared. I think her level of preparation is what really you know, besides you know, the belief that Rodney was innocent. I think her level of preparation is. Um, what really won them over. Kay, had you had any training in this sort of investigative type work? No, not at all. Not at all. I just started digging and just kept digging. And so, <laughs> you know, one one yeah. puzzle piece leads to another. <laughs> it's just amazing. And you managed to get the attention of Steve Steve Weinberg, who Leah Rothman mentioned there. He's the founder of the Midwest Innocence Project, professor emeritus um, of journalism at Mizzou. He got involved with this, and it seems like his findings were really critical. Kate, was it difficult to get him interested in this case? Unbelievably, no. Really? Very No, I was very, very nervous contacting him, but I sent him an email and it was a very long, detailed email with a lot of information. And he responded quite quickly and told me that he would need some time to look over. But if he, you know, felt like it was something he could help with, he would ask me for additional information. And it did not take long at all for him to contact me and ask for more information. And then he went full throttle on this. So Leah, he ended up, uh, he and his students ended up finding out a lot. What are some things you can tell us that pointed towards Rodney's innocence beyond uh, Kay's belief in her father? Well, I think, um, some of what they uncovered, I mean, you know, they took a semester to look at the case and to interview people. And, um, you know, they did a deep dive into the case. I think they learned, um, first of all, you know, they tried to track down transcripts from the first trial and those those could not be uncovered. They couldn't find those anywhere. They looked at the the initial investigation and how Melissa was interviewed um, over the course of you know the month before Rodney had been um, inter uh, sorry uh, arrested. Mm-hmm. And I think they just started to look. They broke down the case. They broke down the investigation. They broke down the investigative procedures. Um, they talked to you know jurors. They they basically you know, reinvestigated the case. And, um, you know, there were also questions about the hair that had been found, um, you know, on the blue blanket that helped convict Rodney. Um, So all of these things together, I think, were just, you know, it was just huge revelations for them at every turn. So, Kay, when this physical evidence was finally tested, none of it matched your father. That includes the hair that had been used against him at trial. How did you feel when you heard that news? Did you think, okay, it's all over at this point. He's going to come home. That's exactly what I felt. I was elated. I thought, finally, somebody has to listen to us now. Now it's not just some crazy, desperate daughter saying, hey, my dad didn't do it. Now we have proof. Now the courts have to listen. I fully believed he would be out within weeks. And it didn't end up being weeks. I mean, this this ended up being years after that. Almost a decade. Almost a decade. So for many of those years, um, Joanne Tate's daughter, Melissa, who, again, had been also a victim of this attack, she was not on board for this. And I'm going to play a clip from this podcast. Again, this podcast is The Real Killer from iHeartMedia. Here's Melissa Davis, the daughter of Joanne Tate, talking to you, Leah, about the first time she attended one of Rodney Lincoln's parole hearings. This was back in 2006. I kind of come at it from um, a visceral, very evocative angle, um, playing on the emotions and the heinous ways the crime was carried out, how vicious it was and and bloody and um, just how frenetic it was. It um, 
I played on every emotion that I could in order to make the parole board not listen to him, but listen to me and my uncle. I was, there was nothing that was off limits. I was cutthroat about it, honestly. Because your goal was what? To keep him in prison. And that is Melissa Davis. And so she stuck by her story for quite some time. But it wasn't just her. She'd been a seven-year-old, of course, when this happened. Kay, it was also your your own sister. She pretended this wasn't happening. She even said at one point that she would pretend that Rodney wasn't her father. Was that hard for you, that there was a split within your own family? It really wasn't an issue between us. Um, You have to remember, my sister was only 10 years old when this happened. Mm Mm-hmm. And my parents were divorced, so we already only had our dad part of the time. And for this to happen, you know, and she's 10 years old, it was really hard for her to process what was going on and how something of this magnitude could happen and be wrong. Um, As far as it being an issue between us or there being a divide, there really wasn't a divide. It wasn't something that she felt like, oh my gosh, he's guilty and you're crazy. It wasn't that sort of thing. She just had her own quiet mental battle within herself as to how she sh- could reconcile everything that had happened. Um, but she she wasn't out there saying, hey, he's guilty, don't do this. Mm-hmm. She never believed he was guilty. She just wasn't as positive of his innocence, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it, it totally makes sense. And when everybody is telling you this guy is guilty, the system's telling you he's guilty, even after Steve Weinberg and his class came out with all this journalism that seemed to point the other way, uh, there didn't seem to be much movement on this. And so you can see how anybody would think, okay, they got the right guy. It seems like the critical year was 2015. In 2015, Melissa Davis, the daughter of Joanne Tate, reached out to UK. What was it like when you got a Facebook message from her? She contacted you. It was incredibly shocking. Um, I saw the message come through that said, can we talk? And I thought, oh gosh, can we? Should I? (laughs) I I'm willing. Um, And I made a real quick text message or phone call to my dad's attorney. I'm like, hey, I got this message. She's, can I answer it? And she said, you are not an attorney. You are not acting in any official capacity. You do what you feel is best. So I answered her and I said, absolutely. And her next statement was, I feel like I'm losing my mind. I'm so scared. And as soon as I read that, I knew, oh my gosh. She has had a breakthrough. She understands. She realizes something has changed. And she gave me her phone number and I called her. And when she answered the phone, she was sobbing uncontrollably. And she just kept saying, I'm so sorry. Your poor dad. I'm so sorry. And I'm trying to hold it together on my end because I'm my mind is going a million miles a minute knowing what this means, but how are we going to fix it now? Um, and trying to calm her down because I felt so terrible for her that she was in such distress because none of this was ever her fault. Mm-hmm. And she had so much put on her at such a young age and then felt the burden to carry this, what she believed to be her truth for her entire life. And for her to come out and say, this might be wrong. I had told people in the past when they asked, will Melissa ever admit that, you know, your dad didn't do this? And I I would always say no, because it would break her. This is what her life is. This is what she knows. I don't think that her mind would ever accept this. And in reality, I come to find out later that it actually was more freeing to her than anything that had ever happened. Um, for her to finally be able to go back and see and admit that it was wrong. 
We're talking today to Kay Lincoln. Uh, she fought so hard to have her father, Rodney, exonerated for a murder that happened in 1982, St. Louis. That is the focus of a new podcast called The Real Killer. Um, and we're also talking to Leah Rothman, who's a producer of The Real Killer. Leah, you were able to talk to Melissa Davis at great length for this podcast, and hearing her story is so wrenching. This woman went through so much. Was it hard to talk to her about some of these things? Sure. I mean, you know, this is basically a story and a case that has, it's been her entire life, right? I mean, she was seven years old when not only did she lose her mom, but she and her little sister Renee were brutally attacked. And, and it's, it's a story that, I mean, it continues today. It's, it's literally one person's life story and it's, it is gruesome. It is heart wrenching. And, you know, I mean, I just to think of she was so convinced that she that it was Rodney who had done this to her family and to think what about what strength it takes to come to that realization that it wasn't him and I think she had had some questions some quiet questions in her in her mind and her heart for years but you know wasn't able to to get to that point until she did in 2015 yeah, I mean, you know, this is a story that I haven't been able to walk away from because of the people at the center of it. Um, I mean, I could tear up just thinking about all their strength, you know, how everyone's so strong. Yeah, Leah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned your inability to walk away from this story because this is, is how this podcast came into being. You were working at Crime Watch Daily when they covered this story. And this story has been well covered in many ways by the St. Louis media. The national media, of course, got on it. What made you realize there was so much more here that really needed the podcast treatment? You know, um, the first episode that we told at Crime Watch Daily, it's, you know, a, an hour of television is really 43 minutes of television. And there's only so much of the story you can actually tell. And and then when Melissa watched the show and recanted and we did a I mean, first of all, everyone was stunned, like mm -hmm. no one saw that coming. <laughs> um, so I think also the level of inv investment went up tenfold at that point because, you know, we were just in the middle of it. And um, and I just felt like there's too much of this story that hasn't been heard and hasn't been told and a podcast with you know we have 11 episodes in this in this series um this story these people their struggles their strength deserves the time that you know a podcast can give it and i'm so thankful that we were able to share and show who these people are they're not just headlines they're not just you know names in passing like these are three-dimensional amazing human beings all of them mm -hmm. you know all the people in, in 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 the center of the story so many people who suffered so badly because of the, the violent things that happened um it's just it's so hard to listen to and, and yet it's so important it's also such great storytelling uh oh, you, you talked to so many different people did you find there was anyone you really wanted to talk to and you just weren't able to they, they didn't want to or wouldn't sure i mean you know i reached out to a lot of people who didn't end up <laughs> um, talking and um, I you know I mean I would like to talk with you know Ed Pistacco and Eric Greitens and you know there are lots of people I, I wish I would have been able to talk with um, and you know uh, um, I'm still available to talk if <laughs> you're not you're not letting go of this story even now. <laughs> no. <laughs> We're gonna do a twenty part podcast the next time. <laughs> well, um, well, Kay, as Leah referenced there, I mean, this isn't just one person's story and, and we hear from so many people in this and we also get to know you and, and what it took for, for you to keep fighting and, and beyond just, you know, the one or two lines that we might have seen in other stories. How does it feel to have this story out there now in so much detail? I think about half of the podcast is now out there, new episodes dropping every week. How has that been to have this story now revealed fully? I think it's wonderful. I... 
my hope that what I hope someone gets from this podcast is someone who was is in the position I was, who has a parent or a child, God forbid, or a spouse or any loved one behind bars for a crime they didn't commit, and they cannot find the help that they need, get busy. Start digging. Do whatever you have to do and don't stop. And as you said, you had no special training when you went into this and made this all happen. Do you feel like anybody could do what you did? Because it it feels extraordinary to me that you were able to achieve this. I do believe anybody could do it. Um, I, I, I had, like you said, I had no training. I had no, I never worked in the field of investigation or research or anything to do with the law. I had just started hearing about innocence projects popping up a few years prior to this all beginning in 2003 when the St. Louis City Circuit uh, attorney opened it for DNA testing uh, originally. Mm -hmm. But I I had, you know, in the few years prior to that, I had sent out some questionnaires to be sent to my dad because I, when I started hearing about innocence projects, I'm like, wow, well, this is something that could help my dad. But I never realized that, you know, you don't just call them and they say, oh, okay, we'll go unlock the door. You know, I th- really thought yeah. it was that easy. Um, and when I found out that he would be on waiting list for years, I was like, well, let's see what we can do, you know. And it's just, a, I was lucky. I, I, I was able to make connections with the right people at the right time who were absolutely instrumental in freeing my dad. Well, Kay, that's a that's a very modest take um, on this story. I think you did so much here, but so many people played a role in this. I want to encourage people to check out The Real Killer. That's a production of iHeartMedia. You can find it on the iHeart website. It's also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. Episode 1 just dropped in December. New episodes now dropping regularly. Kay Lincoln, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. And Leah Rothman, producer of The Real Killer, thank you. Thank you so much. This episode was produced by Jane Mather Glass with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com.